The Story of the World, History for the Classical Child, Volume 1, Ancient Times, From the Earliest Nomad to the Last Roman Emperor, Susan Weisbauer. Chapter 10, The First East Ancient China, Lei Zhu and Silkworm. The people who lived in Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers thought they lived at the very center of the world. They called India the East because they had to they had to sail east to reach it. They thought of India as a strange and distant place. But there was a country that seemed even stranger and was more distant than India. China. To the Assyrians and the Babylonians, China was the far, far east. It was all the way on the edge of the world. The people of China and the people of Fertile Crescent didn't know very much about each other. But even though they lived far away, Chinese people chose to live a, near a river, just like the Egyptians and Babylonians and Assyrians did. Ancient people needed rivers to survive. The people of China first lived between the two rivers called the Yellow River and Yangtze, Yangtze River. The area between the rivers was called the Yellow River Valley. The earliest people of China settled between these rivers in the Yellow River Valley and grew crops, especially rice, because it grows well in the wet, wet ground. At first, the Chinese lived in separate villages like the people of Mesopotamia. But eventually, a great leader united the different villages of the Yellow River Valley into one kingdom. The leader who united Chinese villages was named Huang Di. He lived so long that we really don't know very much about him, but there are plenty of stories about his rule. Legends say that Huang Di first discovered medicine and taught the Chinese people how to cure illnesses. His wife, the Empress Lei Zhu, discovered that silkworms made their cocoons out of their silk threads. One day, the Empress Lei Zhu sat in her garden beneath the mulberry trees. Outside the palace walls, she could hear the noises of the trading carvings, the sound of camel hooves on stone, and the cries and the cries of street merchants selling candy, jewelry, and tea. But Lei Zhu's walled garden was quiet and peaceful. The breeze mo- moved the moved the leaves of mulberry tree above her. Min Lai, she called to her mate, bring me my bring my lunch out here. I will eat in garden today. Soon Min Lai brought out the Empress's favorite meal, turtle meat with garlic and gingers. Candied fruit, rice, and a pot of streaming fra- fragrant tea. Lei Zhu breathed, breathed in the rich smell of tea as she poured into her cup. She lifted the cup to her mouth. Something splashed into it, right in front of her nose. She looked down into her cup. There, floating in the hot water, was something small and round and white. She glanced up into the branches of the mulberry tree. Hundreds of little white cocoons were dangling just over her head. The cocoons, the silkworm, of uh, cocoons of silkworm. Inside the cocoons, the silkworm were changing into moths. Soon they would, soon they would chew the cocoon. Uh, soon they would chew through the cocoons and fly away. Look, Min Lai, she said, a silkworm cocoon fell right in my, into my tea. Let me get you a fresh cut, Empress Lei Zhu. The maid offered. Wait, Lei Zhu said. She carefully lifted the cocoon out of her head. It seemed to be made from a thin, bright head wrapped a hundred thousand times around the silkworm within. The hot water had begun to unravel it. Lei Zhu pulled gently at the end of the thread and drew it out, longer and longer and longer. She rose from her seat and walked through the garden, trailing the thread behind her. 
It was so long that she circled the garden with it a dozen times. The thread was so light then it floated on the wind, and it shone in the sun like melting, melting silver. If only I could weave this into cloth, Lazy marveled. What a robe I could make for my husband, the emperor. But this, it is too thin to weave, Min Lai said. Pay me another cocoon, Min Lai, the emperor said, emperor said. We will unravel another thread. All afternoon, the empress and her maid unraveled the fine, shining threads from the silk warm cocoons. They twisted the threads together until there were, they were thick, as thick as a thread of cocoon. And then the empress called her dressmaker. Can you weave a cloth made from? Can you weave a cloth from these threads? She asked. I have never seen threads like these. The dressmaker exclaimed. They are fine. Uh, they are fine as fine. As, they are as fine as hairs, but as soft as the petal petal of a flower. She took the threads away and wove them into a cloth that she shone that shone like water in the sh sunshine. And from that cloth, Lei Zhu made a robe for her husband, the emperor. When he sighed, he gasped with wonder. From now on, he said, "We will call this silk. The secret of making this wonderful, wonderful cloth must never leave the palace. Only." Royal family can know this treasure was yielded by the silkworm cocoons. So from then on, Lazu and her court made the wonderful cloth called silk. They fed the silkworms on trays of mulberry leaves, waited until the worms wove their cocoons, and carefully unra unraveled the cocoons for their precious th threads of silk. Soon China became famous for its silk. The cloth that no one else in the world knew how to make. The pictograms of ancient China. We don't know much for certain about Huang Di, or about the rulers who followed him, because they didn't leave any written records about their empires. Almost everything that we know about these very ancient Chinese rulers. Has been passed down in stories and legends, from person to person, over true over thousands of years. We don't know what parts of stories, the stories, are true, and what parts were added to make them more interesting and more exciting. We do know that the Chinese went on living in the Yellow River Valley, and that they grew rice, raised silkworms, and tried to defend themselves from against invaders. And we know that a new leader came to power. Hundreds of years after Huang Di, his name was Tiang, and his family was called Shang family. Tiang became king around 1766 BC, BCE, or his family would rule the Yellow River Valley for the next 500 years. In the China, this was called a dynasty, one family keeping control of a country for many, many years, passing the crown along from father to son, from brother to brother. Or from uncle to nephew, we know much more about Shang Dynasty than we do about the rulers who came before it. During the ruler rule of Shang family, the Chinese began to use bronze. They made weapons, wheels, and farming tools out of bronze. These tools and weapons made of bronze didn't didn't rot away like wooden tools. Thousands of years later. Archaeologists discovered that the bronze tools and weapons buried beneath the ruins of Shang buildings. The bronze weapons tell us that the Chinese who lived during the rule of China, Shang Dynasty knew how to fight with bows and arrows. They used chariots when they attacked their enemies, and they were wore shields and armor to protect protect themselves. 
The farming tools tell us that they grew wheat and mulberries, as well as rice, and that they used plows pulled by horses to farm their fields. But that's not all about Shang Dynasty left us. During the rule of the Shang, the Chinese began to use writing for the first, for the very first time, and we can still still read this writing because it was often engraved on bones and on bronze plagues that have last that have lasted for thousands of years. At first, the the early Chinese writing was made of pictures. These special special pictures are called pictograms. Picto means picture, and gram means writing. Pictograms are words that look like pictures. For example, here is a pictogram for sun. It's a picture of the sun with the sun's rays shining out at both sides. The pictogram for water looks like this. Can you see the waves in the water? Here is a strong dynasty pictogram that means house. Here is a strong dynasty that means bow and arrow. And there is a more complicated pictogram that means soldier. This soldier is carrying a halberd, a weapon that has an axe on one side and a dagger on the other. Chinese people, Chinese people use these pictograms to write single messages. The pictograms looked almost exactly like the words they represent. Farming in ancient China. Most people who lived in ancient China were farmers. They raised animals like pigs, chickens, and cows. They grew grain just like people in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. But the people of China grew a kind of grain that the Egyptians and Mesopotamia couldn't grow rice. Couldn't grow rice. Rice will only grow where the ground is very wet for most of the year. Their ground in Egypt and Mesopotamia was too dry for rice, but near the Yellow River in China, whole fields stayed wet for months and months. Rice could grow there. Ch- Chen was seven years old. He lived in China with his father, a rice farmer, his mother, his grandfather, and his little sister. One spring morning, Chen woke up before sunrise. The room where he slept with the rest of his family was still dark. But Chen was too excited to get to go back to sleep. This morning, he would go with his father to work on work in the rice fields for the very first time. He hoped that it wouldn't rain. He hoped that it wouldn't rain. But he couldn't see out the past, out past the stiff paper that covered the window. Chin got up and tiptoed out of the room, past where his parents, his grandfather's, and his and his little sister lay sleeping on their pallets on the floor. He opened the door as quietly as he could. From his front steps, he could hear the roar of the Yellow River. The river was fuller than usual because of because of the spring rains, and it was so noisy that the people in China, little Chin's little village, village could hear it, it a mile away. Chin looked up, just beginning to turn a beautiful, full, beautiful clear pink. A spring breeze was blowing. It was going to be. A beautiful day. He could hear the pigs brooding and grunting behind the house, and the chickens scratching, scratching around the edges of their pen. China, Chin, Chin fed the three pigs, 
and the four chickens every morning. He decided that he would feed them right away before his father got up. Then all his chores would be finished. After he fed the animals, Chin washed his hands, con combed his hair, and dressed. He picked up his sleeping mat and, and put it outside to air. Then he knelt down beside his father's pallet and whispered, Father, are you awake? Are you well this morning? Can I bring you water for food? Chin this every, do the, did this every morning. It was his duty as the oldest son to make sure that his father had everything that he needed. Chin's father opened his eyes and laughed. Are you ready to go to work already? He said, can we go right now? Wait until I've had my rice and tea, Chin's father said, getting up. Chin waited impatiently by the door. His mother was grinding rice into flour. Flour, she would make the flour into little sweet cakes for dinner. Chin, Chin's baby sister played on the floor with her f favorite rag doll. Finally, Chin's father finished his breakfast. He led Chin down the hill towards the river where the rice fields stood. Weeks ago, the Yellow River had flooded out over the rice fields. It spreads water all over the flatland, deeper than Chin was tall. Then the water began to flow away back into the river, leaving soft, fertile mud from the river's bottom all over the ground, but water still stood ankle-deep all over the rice fields. Do you see this any tiny... Do you see this tiny rice plant here in this special bed? Chin's father asked. Today, I'll be moving them out into the field so that they can grow larger. Your job will be to pull weeds out of the field while I plant. Chin rolled up, rolled up the legs of his plant, pants and waded out into the water. The water was ice cold. At first, his feet hurt from the cold. Then they started to go numb. He had to put his hands down into water pull, to pull weeds. His fingers were stiff with the cold, but he kept working. He could see his father planting rice seeding seedlings up ahead of him. His father never stopped working. Chin was determined to work as hard as his, hard as his father. The sun rose up higher and higher, and Chin's back and head grew warm in the sunshine, but his fingers and feet ached with cold. Finally, his father called him back to dry land. You've worked like a man this morning, he said. Let's go back on to the house for our midday meal. Chin followed his father back to, back up to the house. His back hurt from bending over. His feet were wet and chilly. His hands were covered with cold mud, but he was proud of the work he had done. Back at the house, his mother had fixed him a special treat, me, treat me to go along with this rice. And his father poured him a cup of hot steaming tea to warm him. Chin huddled beside the clay stove, listening to his father grandfather tell about great floods of long ago. When I was a boy, his grandfather said, the spring rays came down and down and down day after day until the Yellow River rose up and overflowed its bank. But it didn't just flood our fields. Great rushing floods were swirled down on our village and swept our houses away. We were homeless. Shin shivered. He hoped that the Yellow River would never flood his home. The end of chapter 10.